Jen Apgar, I work in the Youth Services Department. Uh, my name is Stephen Foley. I am TVBC's Outreach Librarian. And on the next slide, you can see here some um, pictures of some of our staff. And as you can see, some staff are camera shy. Some sent in some pictures of uh, instead of their pictures. But um, um, here we are. And on the next slide, just wanted to mention that like many public libraries, um, our building is closed, but this library is not. We're, um, it, we're more than a building or books. It's the people, the staff, and our patrons. Staff is working from home and right now are continuing to work from home. And so today we're going to explain a bit about what the types of virtual services we offer are. Um, and while the focus for this is virtual services, Jen is also going to explain what some of the other services are that we are currently providing. Um, next slide. So a bit of a background about who we are, um, just to kind of explain who we are to get them the better sense of what types of things we can and um, can't offer virtually. So we are the Talking Book and Braille Center. Next slide. And we are part of the New Jersey State Library. So that makes us state employees. And because we're state employees, right now we are affected by the state furloughs. That does not change what we're doing. It just means that we're going to have a longer, a slightly longer response time to um, emails and calls and things like that. Next slide. While we are part of the state library, so we're state employees at, um, for New Jersey, we are also part of a network, we're a network library for a national program. And that national program is called the National Library Service for the Blind, for the blind and Print Disabled, or NLS. Frequently during the program, we'll use NLS, the abbreviation for um, National Library Service for the Blind and Print Disabled. NLS is part of the Library of Congress, and it's a national program. Um, briefly, they provide the materials, both audiobooks and Braille, and the standards and guidelines for who can borrow those audiobooks and Braille, and the people who can borrow them are folks who are blind and print disabled. And we're going to get into the specifics of um, all of this. So NLS provides the materials, but regional libraries like TBBC provide the actual one-on-one -on -one services to the people who are actually borrowing the program. Um, so if somebody lives in New Jersey and is print disabled, they can borrow materials from us. In New Jersey, we are part of, as I mentioned, the state library. Each state implement use it, has this um, program from NLS in their state, but each state is unique and does it a little bit differently. In some states, the program like ours is part of the Department of Education. In some states, it's part of their Commission for the Blind. In other states, it's part of their local public library. The important thing to mention, though, is to, to take away is in New Jersey, TBBC is the entity that takes care of these services for the entire state. And if as you're hearing about this, you're thinking about someone who could make use of these services but are in a different state, rest assured in that different state, there's an entity that will be able to provide them services. Um, we are also the ones who do outreach and training and programs in the state, such as the program that we're doing now. Um, next slide, please. Just to give you a bit of um, history about NLS, um, to have an idea of who they are and what they do, um, NLS was established in 1931, and it was established as a library for blind adults. Before then, the libraries that had Braille for people who are blind 
were things that were very local. So say there might have been one in Boston or one in New York City or one in Chicago, but people who didn't live close to those libraries didn't have the benefit of being able to borrow those Braille books. And each of those libraries was investing their own time and effort into creating those Braille volumes. In 1931, the United States decided on a national um, level to establish the library and establish the funding for the library. And at that point in 1931, they decided that NLS would be established in order to create the materials and the standards, but they would leave it up to the states independently to decide how to implement it. One of the reasons this was done in 1931, in addition to recognizing that it just made financial sense to have something centralized like this, is it was a reaction to the number of veterans from the Great War, from World War I, who had come home with different injuries resulting in their loss of vision. And the United States also wanted to be able to provide services to those veterans. As time went by, NLS expanded as they realized that there were more people who could benefit from the Braille and then the audiobooks as they began creating audiobooks. In 1952, children became eligible for services. In 1966, was the real, um, realization also that, hey, people could be using these audiobooks who, for other physical reasons, can't read a traditional print book. So physical disability was added as a require as um something that could qualify for our services. In 1996, the Chaffee Amendment was created, and I'm going to um, explain about that in a little bit more detail. But before I get to that, I also wanted to mention that in 1999, Web Braille was started, and Web Braille is exactly what it says. It's a Braille book, but it's a book that you can access through the internet to read. We'll show you the device a bit later on on how that actually is done. The important thing to remember is that over 20 years ago, NLS was doing basically electronic braille books. They've been in this for a long time. Um, in 2009, something called BARD was launched. Again, we'll explain that in a little bit detail, uh, a little bit further on, um, but BARD is what allows us to digitally lend both our audio books and our braille books. And then the final highlight on this history is in 2019, NLS updated its, its name to what it is now to better reflect the different people who they serve. Um, next slide. The Chaffee Amendment. I promise you this will be the last of the boring law stuff that we talk about. While in, in the 1930s, the library was established, part of the process of how they recorded books and how they made the Braille books involved not just selecting the book they wanted to be made into Braille or into audio, but then having to do phone calls and letters to be able to get the permission of the copyright holder to make that Braille and audio book. Now, as I'm sure you probably realize, many copyright holders were very agreeable to these books being made because they realized, hey, this is what's going to enable folks who are blind or low vision to read our books. But still, it added to the process. So if you had a book that was published in September, by the time you got all the approvals, it could be three or four months before you could then even begin recording the book. So that was something that was really a stumbling block to being able to have equal access to everyone who is print disabled. The Chaffee Amendment basically says that NLS is allowed to, um, and then I'll just read um, aloud here, it allows NLS to reproduce or distribute copies of previously published non-dramatic literary works in specialized formats exclusively for use by the blind or other persons with disabilities. So in regular English, it means that when NLS wants to create that Braille or audiobook, they do not have to call and ask for the publisher for permission. They can just go ahead and do it. This is obviously something really huge 
um, of a benefit because what that also means, by the way, it means that the publishers and copyright holders aren't getting paid for these books or audiobooks that are being done. Now, there are limitations, as you can see, of what can be um, made this way. First, it has to be a previously published non-dramatic literary work. That basically means that things like plays are not going to be found in NLS since that's a dramatic literary work. That said, when there's a very popular play out, such as Harry Potter and the Cursed Child, they'll still go that old fashioned route of asking the copyright holder, do we have permission to make this in audio? And in the case of Harry Potter, they did get that permission and we now have it in audio. Specialized formats means our specialized formats are Braille and audio, but it also says exclusively for use by the blind or other persons with disabilities. While only folks who are Braille readers can read Braille, anyone can listen to an audiobook. So the way we comply to the Chaffee Amendment is being very careful. The people who are members of our library who can borrow those, these books are only the people who are eligible to use our library. And even then when we lend it or when people download it, they do we do it using um, different digital rights management and things like that to further ensure that only those folks who are um, qualified to borrow these books do in fact borrow it. Um, and to let you know a little bit more about who qualifies and how, Stephen's going to explain that now. Next slide. Uh, thanks, Liz. So I am going to go over uh, eligibility criteria now. Um, because of the Chaffee Amendment, our services are only for those who qualify. They aren't just for people who prefer audio to print. Uh, and the current language has it that individuals are eligible if they cannot read standard print, hold a book, or turn pages due to blindness, visual, visual impairment, physical impairment, or reading disability. Blindness and visual impairment would qualify a person if their vision prevents them from reading standard print. Examples can include macular degeneration or glaucoma. We often say that if you are unable to read the print in a standard newspaper, you would qualify under visual impairment. A physical impairment will qualify someone if they are prevented from holding a typ typical physical book or turning pages for an extended period of time. Examples of this can include arthritis. Lastly, a reading disability would qualify someone for our services. And I also do want to say that concussions can also qualify. One important thing to note about each of our qualifying conditions is that they can be either permanent or temporary. And then one last important thing to remember is that our eligibility standards are different than those for the New Jersey Commission for the Blind and Visually Impaired. This means that just because someone has been denied services through the Commission for the Blind and Visually Impaired, that does not mean they are ineligible through us. Uh, next slide. So in order to prove that someone does qualify for our services, they must receive certification from a certifying authority. In this case, a certifying authority is an individual who is designated by NLS to sign off that someone has a legitimate qualifying condition. It does not necessarily need to be a doctor who signs off. Besides doctors, registered nurses and therapists can act as a certifying authority. The list also includes professional staff of hospitals and welfare agencies, such as social workers. Last but certainly not least, I also want to emphasize that professional librarian staff can act as a certifying authority. If any librarians here know of patrons they believe would benefit from our services, you are more than welcome to sign off on their application. Certification here only involves a signature from the authority. We do not require any additional medical documentation. And in fact, we ask that those types of documents are not sent in. Uh, next slide. There is one exception to this. Uh, that exception is when someone qualifies due to a reading disability. In these cases, it must be a doctor of medicine or a doctor of osteopathy specifically 
who signs off as the certifying authority. This is said by the MLS directly. We do understand that in most cases, it is not a doctor who diagnoses a reading disability. So in these cases, the person who will sign off can do so in consultation with the person who made the diagnosis. Another thing we suggest is that if someone qualifies for our services because of a reading disability and another qualifying condition, they can claim eligibility through the other condition in order to make the certification process e easier. Next slide. Because of everything I just went over, an application is required for our services. The application provides us with some basic information on our patrons, such as contact info and reading preferences. But it is also the place where eligibility and certification are recorded. Our, app our application is located online, and while we continue to work from home, we ask that completed applications are sent to us via email. If an application is sent through physical mail or through fax, it may get lost due to staff not being in the building to receive them. Therefore, email is the most consistent way to ensure your application is received. The majority of the application can be filled out digitally. The only item that we do require an actual signature for is the certifying authority. This can be sent in along with the application as an attachment though, and a phone picture can be used as long as it is of clear quality. The only other requirement is that the section must be filled out entirely, including the name and job title of the certifying authority. And with that, I'm gonna pass it over to Jen, who's gonna tell you a little bit more about our services. If you wanna go to the next slide. So I just want to talk briefly about the types of services that we offer, that we are currently offering uh, while working from home, working virtually. On the next slide, we have uh, the list of the virtual services that we are offering. We do still offer our reader's advisory, uh, where our reader services staff is working very hard at home to answer any calls or emails that have come in. They're doing a great job helping our patrons to be able to offer things like read-alikes if patrons are calling and needing help with some books that they want to download next. Um, for any particular books that they've read or authors that they like, they can offer some read-alikes. They're also able to offer perhaps some books suggestions of what uh, might be popular right now or things that they know the patron might be interested in reading. Um, they might be able to suggest some different subjects that the patron might be interested in. And they're also there to help with um, our BARD download service, whether it's to sign up or to uh, how to answer questions about how to download and some basic tech support as well. As Stephen mentioned, we are also still taking new patrons and he did explain how to apply for services. If you have any questions about that, always reach out to us. We can answer any questions. As I mentioned, our BARD and our BARD mobile services are also available for everyone as we work remotely. On the next slide, I wanna talk about some of the benefits that TBBC offers. We do have, as we mentioned, our downloadable audio and braille books. That is our BARD service. And the nice feature with our BARD downloadable books is that there is no wait list and there's no due date. And we have over 100,000 titles available to our patrons to be able to download. So what this means is, um, unlike the public library where they uh, public, li public libraries have to buy rights to their digital books to be able to download. So therefore, they may only be able to get five or 10 copies of a book. And when those books even digitally are checked out, patrons have to go on a wait list to be able to get those books. With us, that's not the case. We do not have any, um, any uh, limits as to how many people can download a book at one time. So for instance, when Michelle Obama's book Becoming came out, it was extremely popular amongst our patrons. So let's say, for instance, we had 200 people that wanted to download that book at one time. 200 people could download that book at one time. There were no restrictions on um, people that were ahead of somebody else online or anything like that. As many copies that needed to be downloaded could be downloaded. And with that as well, there's no due dates for the books. So if a person is downloading a book, that book never comes off their per that person's device until they physically remove it from the device. There is no, it does not expire, it does not come off, and it, it will stay there to infinity as long as, as if the person wants it on there. Uh, so that is some of the benefits that we do offer with our downloadable books. On the next slide, we have some other services. Uh, or benefits that we offer as well. Some of our 
books that we have available are, are not available commercially. As I mentioned, we have over 100,000 titles that are available to download from our service. And with that are books that you wouldn't find commercially available, whether it's in your, your bookstore or your public library. And that's because they may just not be popular enough for publishers to make them available for purchase. But because our patrons need to access them in an accessible version, we are able to provide these types of books. It may be books like nonfiction books that wouldn't be as popular in the public who want to listen to audiobooks just because perhaps, but with our patrons, it would be crucial to have a gardening book or a cookbook Book, or for our kids science project books. Um, nonfiction is very, very popular for us and uh, it is, we're a great resource to have, um, to, be, to be able to offer. Another type of book that may not be found on a commercial market are your B-list books that were never gained that popularity as much as some of your bestsellers or very popular books, but we do have those as well. We do also offer books in different languages beyond English. We do, of course, have a very large Spanish collection, but we also offer other languages like Italian and French and so on. Uh, another service that we offer is that our services are at no cost to our patrons. Everything we do is by the mail. Everything is given to us or provided to us by, the, by NLS. All of the materials, the audiobook players that are needed to listen to our books, which I will talk about later on in the presentation, our, the grant, our grant funding is from the IMLS, and anything that is provided for our patrons is at no cost. So therefore, that means when we do provide services by mail, the, the postage is covered as well. Patrons do not have to pay for postage. The only thing that may incur a cost is if they want to use their own personal device to download books. But aside from that, uh, the materials that we provide for our patrons are provided at no cost. I'm going to pass this on to Liz now to talk a little bit more about the books um, that you might not find commercially available. Um, before I came to work at TVBC, I worked in a public library. So before I became as familiar with TBBC and how it worked and how the books work, one of my reactions to audio, the audio books that um, TBBC offered was, oh, that's nice, but my public library has so many audio books um, that that must be just for patrons where they don't have a good local public library. Um, little did I know, I wasn't familiar with the Chaffee Amendment and all those things and basically that what it meant is that NLS was able to record books that just had not been commercially recorded for one reason or the other. Jen just mentioned um, some of them that, uh, as you know, when an author sells their rights for a book, they also sell the audio rights. And so the audio may or may not be uh, made. Sometimes it's not made, as Jen mentioned, because um, it's basically considered a midless title and the publishers and audiobook producers are waiting to see if it sells enough that it makes sense to make that as an audio. Sometimes the reverse has happened. A book got a lot, a book series might have gotten a lot of buzz at the very beginning, but then it didn't sell quite as much. So it was still being published, but they decided not to invest in doing audio for the rest of the book in the series. Something else that happens is with NLS, once they've recorded a book and they have that um, copy, it's there forever, pretty much. Um, unlike commercial audiobook um, publishers, where sometimes it'll only be available for a handful of years to purchase, and then it's not currently being made yet. Um, I'm somebody who needs to kind of see what that means to get the full appreciation. So what we did here is we just listed an example of some titles that when we put this slide presentation together were not available commercially, that you couldn't get it anywhere else but NLS. Um, and as you can see, the first three titles here are fiction and then the final um, uh, one is a cookbook. Um, an, an example of the nonfiction that isn't often made into audio. Um, on the next slide, please. Here you'll see that for of Irish blood, if you had had a patron coming in saying, oh, you know, all my friends are talking about this book of Irish blood, I really want to listen to it. And as a librarian, you would have pulled up World Cat. And if once you had done that, you'd have been like, oh, this book is only available in print. I can't help you out. 
if that patron is someone who is print disabled, who is looking for audio now because of low vision, or as Stephen mentioned, because arthritis, they just can't hold that book or turn the pages, we have that book so we can turn that no to your patron into a yes, except you wouldn't have known it from just looking at WorldCat where it tells you it's just only print copies. The next slide. Um, the next spot, this one shows um, Amazon because sometimes librarians are just like the rest of the world and they'll look in Amazon to see whether or not something exists in audio. And here for somewhere in France, um, it shows that there's an audio CD available, but it also shows it is available used for over $80. So even though theoretically it would be available for you or your patron to buy, most libraries aren't going to be buying a used CD to add their collect to their collection, and very few people are looking to spend that much money. However, NLS does have it. So again, this is a place where your initial reaction would be no, but when you looked further, you'd find out that NLS could turn your no into a yes for people who are um, for people who qualify for our program. Um, one thing I want to mention here is the reason our books aren't listed in Amazon is because they're just for our program and you can't buy it. It's it, you can offer NLS a million dollars. I don't think you have a million dollars to offer them, but if you did, it would still be a no. You can only borrow these books if you qualify. The reason it's not on WorldCat is because these books also aren't available for interlibrary loan because, again, it's only for the patrons who qualify. An interlibrary loan can go to anybody, not just qualifying patrons. Um, on the next slide. And just as a general roundup, our audiobooks are similar to what you've got in the public library. We've got the popular subjects and interests. We have popular authors. We have um, books for children and young adult. Um, I would just like to mention for children and young adult, we have picture books and um, beginning readers. But one thing to remember when working with children who want audiobooks, frequently they're listening at a higher comprehension level than what they would be reading. So that's something to keep in mind um, when looking at the children's books. And for professional narration, NLS has been in this business, as you saw, since the 30s doing audiobooks. Some folks sometimes are under the mistaken assumption that because these books are for folks who are print disabled or blind, that for some reason that means it's relying on volunteers and volunteer narrators to create the books. NLS has professional standards. They actually created the professional standards that many audiobook producers now follow. And part of those standards include hiring professionals to be the narrators for those books. So it's um, so that's one thing that sometimes your patrons might ask, oh, but you know, volunteer narrators can sometimes ruin a book. You can assure them that the books coming from NLS have professional narration. Um, on the next slide too. What we also have are magazines that people don't always realize. We have magazines in both Braille and audio. Um, combined, it's over 80 titles. Some examples of the magazines we have for adults are AARP, National Geographic, and People. And for children and teens, um, National Geographic Kids, Spider, and Seventeen. The Back issue, the current issues are available for download as are back issues. A handful of the magazines have been impacted by producers being impacted by the by um, COVID-19, but most of them are now available and available for download. What's nice about the back issues being available is it's not just the current magazines that we offer, such as National Geographic or Spider, if at any time in the past five or six years, um, NLS had created an audio copy of a magazine, those back issues are still available, even if the magazine has stopped publishing 
in a weekly or monthly format. So for example, Cooking Light, which is a popular cooking magazine, those back issues that NLS recorded are still available online. Now, we've mentioned the types of audio and braille books and magazines that we have, and we keep on talking about available for download. Um, in the next slide, Stephen is going to start explaining a little bit more of what that means. Yes, so uh, as we mentioned a few times, we do have the ability for our patrons to download their books, and that is through our BARD service. Uh, BARD, which is an acronym that stands for Braille and Audio Reading Download, uh, allows our patrons to go online and download their books over the internet. Uh, this way, it gives patrons 24-7 access to our entire collection. Uh, and was, as was stated before, it offers other benefits too, and that there are no wait lists for books um, and no due dates. So unlike some other public libraries, you don't have a limited amount of uh, digital audiobooks that can go out. If we had uh, a thousand people that wanted the same audiobook on the same day, all a thousand of them could download it through Word. Uh, to get started for BARD, you would go to the BARD website, which is located at the footnote there. Um, and then here we have, oh, you can go to the next slide. Oh, go back, sorry. Yep, so here we have uh, some of the different ways that patrons would interact with the books that they download from BARD. Um, on the top left, you will see an example of a refreshable Braille display. Uh, we can also download our Braille books from BARDs. Using one of these devices, you would download the Braille book onto a flash drive and then upload it to one of these devices. At that point, small metal pellets will then raise depending on the book to create Braille cells. Uh, this would allow patrons to re download, to read their downloaded Braille books line by line. Uh, besides BARD, uh, besides Braille, BARD also allows patrons to read their audiobooks in two separate ways. The first way is by downloading book files onto a flash drive and then listening to them on a library supplied digital doc talking book player. Uh, the book files are copied onto the flash drive, which is then inserted into the side of the player. Uh, we also have a mobile app. Uh, this app allows patrons to download and listen to their books right from a mobile device. And I'm going to go into a little bit more detail on that in just a moment, if we want to move on to the next slide. Uh, one other thing I want to talk about is Bard Express. Bard Express is software you can download to your computer to help download books from Bard. The benefit of Bard Express is that it streamlines the download process for books. Downloading a book from the BARD website requires downloading a compressed folder and then extracting the book files onto a folder in the flash drive. BARD Express automates some of these steps, making the service more accessible to those who might not otherwise be able to use it. Uh, the one drawback is that BARD Express is only available for Windows computers. Because of this, Knowing how to download off the website is important for people who might be using a different operating system. Once a person is registered for BARD, they can download and log into BARD Express. I'm um, gonna go to the next slide. When a patron downloads BARD books from a computer onto a flash drive and they are played on one of our talking book players, uh, multiple books can be loaded onto a single flash drive. When this happens, patrons have two options for moving from book to book on their flash drive. The sequential play feature allows patrons to go from book to book in a linear order. And then if a patron wants to select a specific book in the queue, they can use the bookshelf feature. Next slide. As I mentioned before, we also have the mobile app for BARD, which is aptly named BARD Mobile. The app is free on all, all major app marketplaces. In order to log into the app, individuals must be a TBBC member and also have registered for BARD on the main BARD website. This will give users the login credentials they need to access the app and begin downloading books. So basically anyone can download the app, but you would need a login ID and password in order to log in and actually use the service. Uh, using the app, 
uh, patrons can download and listen to our entire audiobook collection right from the app using a dedicated interface, which I can show you on the next slide. So here's a screenshot of what it looks like when a book is being played through the mobile app. Uh, developers intended for the layout of the book playback screen to copy the layout of our digital talking book players, which you will see in a few moments. Uh, this allows new users to have a basic idea of the interface layout the first time they use the app. And with that, I'm going to pass it on to Jen, who's going to tell you about how the, you can find some of the books in our collection. Thanks. On the next slide, uh, I know what you're thinking at this point is, this sounds amazing. How do I actually find where the books are that you have? Well, as Liz mentioned, our books are not listed in WorldCat. They're not listed in Amazon. So you do need to know how to find them. One way is to give us a call. We're happy to talk to you. We're happy to answer any questions you might have or try to find a book for you to see if it's available. Uh, you can call our reader services phone line, which is 800-792-8322, extension 861. You can also email us at tbbc at njstatelib.org. Uh, as Liz mentioned in the beginning, we are affected by the furlough, so be patient with us. It may take us a little bit longer to get back to you, but we will get back to you. Um, Another way to find the books that we have available is through a bi-monthly publication called Talking Book Topics. Next slide. Again, Talking Book Topics is produced every, every other month, and in it, it includes the books that have been produced by NLS within those two months. It is not a comprehensive catalog of all the books that are available. That would be way too big, but it does show you the books that have been added within those two months. So it may give patrons an idea of different types of subjects, the books that they may be interested in reading, types of authors, things like that. We oftentimes get patrons calling us when they get the new version of Talking Book Topics, adding books to their request list because books just sound interesting to them. Them. It does provide um, an annotation, the book name, author, how long the book is, the narrator, and things like that. Uh, this Talking Book Topics is can be mailed to patrons when shipping is available. Right now, things are being affected by COVID-19, so mailing has been delayed a bit or can be delayed. But this is available for download either for an audio version or a large print version or a print version on the website. There's also something similar to this called Braille Book Review that lists the Braille books that have been added. Next slide. So as I mentioned, when you're looking at talking book topics, it does give you um, a little bit of information about the book, including some descriptors such as unrated or whether there's descriptions of sex or violence by, uh, or strong language within the book. So as you can see, it does give you the title. Each book has a specific DB number, so that is listed, which helps our patrons if they're calling to give us those numbers to add to the request list, it tells you how long it is, who the author is, who it's read by, which is important for some of our patrons because for some people they might hate an, an narrator. For other people, they may love a narrator, and when they see that the narrator has read something new, they don't care what it is, they just want to listen to it. And then there's also a brief annotation. And the reason for the brief annotation, as well as these descriptors of whether there's violence or strong language in the book, is because unlike going into a bookstore or a public library, a, our patrons cannot pick up the book, look at a cover, or read the back matter and know, or even flip through the pages and know, okay, there are some strong language in this, there may be some violence, there may be some descriptions of sex, and I'm not interested in that. So by adding these descriptors to our books, it gives those patrons the heads up that it may contain that. Some of our books, however, are the commercial audio. We do have, as Liz mentioned, the, the agreements with some of our publishers, or some of the commercial publishers that we have their commercial audio books. With that, we're able to get those books added into our collection a bit faster. And in order to do that, the books come to us as unrated. So as you can see in the first book listed, there is the word unrated mentioned in the annotation, and that will alert the patron to know there may be strong language in this book, but there may not be. We don't know. It has not been rated. So it's kind of a, a read at your own discretion type of book. But this way, patrons at least know that that is there. Uh, next slide, please. This is what the NLS catalog looks like. Anybody can have access to this. You do not need a password to access it. You can go here and search by author, title, keyword to see what is available. Uh, it will then also give you your search results. It will tell you what books we have, but also it will show you if a book is in process. So for instance, I had somebody interested in reading the sequel to The One and Only Ivan. They wanted to know if The One and Only Bob was available. And I was able to go in there and see that The One and Only Bob is currently in progress. It won't tell me when it's becoming available, but it does at least show me that we will be getting it. Next slide. 
This is what the results look like when you do a search for a book in the NLS catalog. So again, it tells you the author, the title, um, and it, this is just a very brief re uh, result that you can see. If you click on more record, more on this record, you can get more information about it, including the annotation. But what's important to note on this particular page is where the arrow is pointing, there is a link, there's a, a link, an active link. And if you click on that for a patron who has a BARD account with us, this will allow the patron to begin downloading the book automatically from BARD. And it, the nice thing about that is it allows, it, it alleviates having to go to BARD, remember the book title or the book number, finding it there, and say it saves the patron a few steps and you can just download directly from this link. Next page. Next slide, excuse me. Another way to find out what books we have is by accessing our OPAC, which we do have. Uh, we have an OPAC just like you would typically think of in a public library. However, you do have to have a password to access this and you have to, you, the password is established and the, and the ID is established once the patron is registered with us at the Talking Book and Braille Center. So what we suggest is if a patron wants access to their OPAC and their, their profile to contact us at TBBC and we can help get that set up. Uh, and I'm going to pass it back over to Liz to talk about some more services. Thank you. And um, some of our additional services, and I would just want to mention before we, I, we talk about the additional services, for the uh, Braille and audio download through BARD, much like yourselves, once we switch to that being the only thing that our patrons could borrow, that we didn't have the physical books anymore, um, we saw a nice leap, like I think about a 20% um, increase in our patrons being able to download. And some of them hadn't done that before and were really surprised to find out that it wasn't as hard or as difficult as they thought it was. And they were really pleased that that gave them 24 seven access to the collection. But just like you, um, we do things that are more than books. And some of the additional services that we've been offering now is one is virtual outreach. Examples are, include this webinar that we're doing, but we've also done um, guest blog posts for uh, places who have put together, say, like a fair about services for people with autism. We've contributed to that. We have something scheduled later this summer where um, we're going to be part of a virtual transition fair, um, a number of different things like that. We also have um, some virtual programming going on. We have a virtual book club that patrons can either call in or use their computer to connect to it. And I think we've got, um, we've got a nice number who are attending that every other week. Um, unfortunately, that is one of the things that is being affected by the furloughs. So we've had to cancel that for July, but we're looking forward to resuming it in August. We put together a TVBC bingo card and our first patron who got bingo on the letter I is 92 years old and she was as pleased as punch to be able to be the first person to complete bingo for us. We um, have some videos up at the New Jersey State Library. At their, we have a playlist at their YouTube channel. And some of them are a bit more of an explanation about how to use some of the things we were talking about here, such as the um, how BART Express works or how to download books on BART. If you want some more information on that, you can go to the YouTube channel. And then we have um, Facebook and Twitter that keep people up to date about what's going on at the library. Next slide. I also wanted to mention um, that we have an electronic newsletter that we've been sending out to folks. And that was something that we began in March when we first shut down and began working strictly from home as a way to keep in, um, in touch with our patrons. And it's basically a short um, electronic newsletter equivalent to about four or five pages where we just, um, a note to people, uh, some book lists, some recommendations of other things that they might be interested in, mentioning things like the book club and book bingo. If you're interested in some of those reader's advisory things we do, you can take a look at some of those past electronic newsletters at the website. Next slide. 
I also wanted to mention NFB Newsline. As I said, you can get magazines from TBBC, but there's also a service called NFB Newsline from the National Federation of the Blind. And this is a resource um, if somebody is print disabled, they're eligible to be able to listen to NFB Newsline. And that basically has state, local, national, and international newspapers and magazines. And because it's something that um, they want to have the information to have those articles up as soon as possible, a lot of it is text to speech as opposed to narration. Because you, as you can imagine, if you were going to sit down and narrate the whole New York Times, it would take a while to actually upload and get that there. So instead, things like that are um, text to speech. If you know somebody who would be interested in this, having the audio version of all these different newspapers and magazines, just let us know. Um, the way to listen to NFB Newsline is there's an app, there's an 800 number, um, it's through the website, and it's also available, works with Amazon's Alexa, which a lot of our patrons really love. And then on the next slide, Stephen is going to talk a little bit about our BARD Library Pilot Program. Thank you. Uh, so the BARD Library Pilot Program is something I'm very excited about. Uh, it's one of my main bailiwicks at the Talking Book and Braille Center. And the program has TBBC partnering with public libraries to let patrons access BARD on a more local level. Because some of our patrons may not be able to download books on their own, the program enables their local library staff to download for them. We provide training on how to download from BARD, and then we encourage TBBC patrons to visit their local library in order to receive these downloaded books. Um, one thing I really like to say about this program is that out of all the NLS network libraries, New Jersey is the only one that is offering this type of service. Uh, we've been doing it for a few years now and it's been a success and we're really excited to keep it going in the future. And to that end, we will be providing virtual trainings to bring new people into the program while in-person outreach remains limited. Uh, if anyone is interested in doing a virtual training for their library, uh, feel free to reach after me after this presentation. My contact info is listed in a couple different places and we can go ahead and set that up for you. And then with that on the next slide, I'm going to pass it off to Jen to bring us on home. So I just want to talk briefly about what our traditional services look like, what they were before our library closed and what they will eventually get back to. I, I know we will get back there. Um, so we are building, as we've all mentioned, the building is closed, but we are still working from home. We have just recently begun able to send uh, materials, uh, books out to some of our patrons that have requested them. It's a limited amount that we're able to send to our patrons and it's only to those patrons that have specifically requested the materials from us as we know they're comfortable with receiving mail from us. So we have just recently started doing that again on limited numbers but wanted to mention that. What you're looking at on the slide right now is uh, what our typical talking book players look like when we are in the library and are able to send materials to patrons, this is what our patrons who have requested the talking book player look like. On the left is our standard player, on the right is our advanced. They both function the same way. The only difference is the advanced has five extra buttons that allow for a little bit more navigation. Some patrons love it, some patrons hate it. It truly is just a personal preference, but they both still have all the same basic functions. Next slide. This is what our books by mail look like. So if anybody is familiar with us uh, from about probably about a year and a half, two years ago, uh, maybe a year now, I'm, I don't remember how long we switched over, but prior to what our books look like on the screen you're looking at, each of our books were preloaded, one book per cartridge, a specific book on a specific cartridge. That cartridge had to go back into the specific case that it came in. A patron would receive that book, flip their card over. When they were done with it, the cartridge goes back into the same exact case it came from, put the card back in and mail it back. It became a little bit cumbersome for our patrons. We just recently switched to a new version of how we send our books out, where essentially we are just downloading books for patrons who don't have the ability to download. So what you see on the screen is what our cartridges now look like. They're all completely customizable. There is no identifying information on the cartridge or the case itself so that they can be reused. Uh, and when the patron gets it, the, 
the cartridge can go back into any container. It doesn't matter anymore. And there's no longer a card that needs to be put back in, flipped over, put back in. There is a mailing label already attached to the container. So it makes it nice and easy for the patrons. Uh, there is the image of what the card that the patron gets with their book looks like. And it lists all of the books that have been on that cartridge for that person. These cartridges are all customized for each patron specifically. So unless by some strange chance uh, each uh, two patrons in a row ask for the same same exact books, every cartridge is going to be different for each patron. Uh, and again, it's basically just us downloading. Uh, we have access now to all of the entire collection of downloadable materials so we can get any book that a patron wants to them. There is no longer any wait lists truly at all for any of our patrons. So we're able to get that out. Next slide. This is just, again, a brief explanation of what Stephen mentioned earlier with sequential play and bookshelf, that the patrons have the ability to navigate through the books. If you have any questions about this, you can uh, reach out to us. But in the essence of time, I want to jump to the last slide, which is just saying thank you for attending today. Thank you for being here with us. This is our contact information once again um, to reach out to us if you have any questions. And uh, as was mentioned in the beginning, this has been recorded. So I will now open it up to any questions that we might have. All right, well, thank you very much for the presentation. Um, if anybody does have a question, please, uh, you can submit it using the question feature uh, in the GoToWebinar dashboard on your screen, or again, you can email me um, or any of these people if it's something that you would like to discuss afterwards, um, please feel free to do that. So, all right, um, our first question is, can, you request magazines be added as well. You showed how you, how that can be done for books you don't currently have. Just looked and you don't have Family Tree magazine. Um, this is Liz. Uh, the question was about adding magazines. And yes. right now the magazines are all recorded um, by NLS. They select the magazines and arrange them um, for them. We can send suggestions to them um, to let them know that this is something that patrons are interested in. Would you record it? For magazines, what the response I've typically gotten in the past has been that um, they have their budget allows for only a certain number of magazines. So if they're looking to add one, they would need from budget wise to take one off. So what they tend to do is they keep a list of the suggestions, and then if a magazine no longer it decides to stop publishing on a um, weekly or monthly basis, then they'll look at the list of suggestions. So if someone has a suggestion, they can send it to us and we can um, send it to NLS. But I'll also mention that um, Newsline does have a lot of magazines for things like Vanity Fair. The magazine that you mentioned, I'm not sure if they have it, but it's also always good to look and see what Newsline also is currently offering for magazines. All right, uh, we had a few comments come in. Uh, one is thank you for this very thorough overview of services. Um, and another one was thank you for this wonderfully comprehensive presentation. Oh, thank you. It's always nice to hear. It's very hard to do a presentation where you can't see people's faces. And so getting that feedback definitely helps. Thank you. Uh, um, there are no questions right now, but we can leave it open for a few more minutes in case anybody thinks of anything um, or if our presenters have any other information they'd like to share.
Alrighty, um, I don't see any more questions coming in. So I would like to thank Elizabeth, Jennifer, and Stephen for the presentation today. I hope everybody found it useful. Um, and I don't know if, if you have anything left to say. Um, nothing else, just thank you all for um, taking the time and for attending this. And I hope that you, that there's patrons who will benefit from it. Yes. Right. Thank you all for attending and reach out with any questions. Thank you. Um, one more person said thank you for the presentation. So it's always good to end on a high note. So um, again, thank you everybody. Uh, I will be emailing a link to the recording out to everybody. So you will have this for future reference. So everybody have a great day. Stay safe. See you later. Thanks. Bye-bye.